On the 27th of April, 1838, shortly after his arrival at Far West Caldwell County, Missouri, Joseph Smith, with Counselor Sidney Rigdon and Clerk George W. Robinson, began dictating what would become the official history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. By the 2nd of May, this first draft of Joseph Smith's history, which is apparently no longer extant, had reached the account of Smith's obtaining the gold plates in September 1827. On this day, Smith dictated a passage that James Mulholland carried over unchanged into the final draft in 1839. I delivered the plates up to the angel, and he has them in his charge until this day, being the second day of May, 1838. Smith's history did not progress much further than this, for there is no record of his working on his history in Missouri after the 4th of May. Any hope of returning to the project while in Missouri was permanently dashed when Governor Lilburn W. Boggs issued his infamous extermination order and imprisoned Joseph Smith and other church leaders in December 1838. After Smith's escape, the project was resumed in Commerce, later named Nauvoo, Illinois, on the 11th of June, 1839, with James Mulholland as scribe. Between this date and Mulholland's death on the 3rd of November, a draft of 25 pages was produced. This draft begins abruptly with the baptisms of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in May 1829, and ends with the events of September 1830. About July or August 1839, Mulholland began copying the Robinson draft, and then his draft, with some editing into Book A1 of the Manuscript History, and managed to record 59 pages prior to his death. After becoming editor-in-chief of the Mormon periodical Times and Seasons, Joseph Smith published the first installment of his history in the 15th of March, 1842, issue. In the next three issues, 1st of April, 15th of April, and 2nd of May, 1842, he published the story of his 1823 encounter with the angel and discovery of the gold plates. This official version carefully stripped out elements of the original story that were tied to his previous occupation as a treasure seer or scryer. The purpose of this video will be to reconstruct the original story and restore it to its folk, magic, and treasure-seeking context, a part of the story the average Mormon is woefully unaware. But first, the official version, as it was published in the Times and Seasons. Following the account of his 1820 vision of deity, Joseph Smith said he fell into diverse temptations to the gratification of many appetites offensive in the sight of God, and that on the evening of the 21st of September, 1823, after I had retired to my bed for the night, I betook myself to prayer and supplication to Almighty God for forgiveness of all my sins and follies. While I was thus in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light appearing in the room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air, for his feet did not touch the floor. He had a loose robe of most exquisite whiteness. It was a whiteness beyond anything earthly I had ever seen. Nor do I believe that any earthly thing could be made to appear so exceedingly white and brilliant. His hands were naked and his arms also a little above the wrist. So also were his feet naked, as were his legs a little above the ankles. His head and neck were also bare. I could discover that he had no other clothing on but this robe, as it was open, so that I could see into his bosom. Not only was his robe exceedingly white, but his whole person was glorious beyond description, and his countenance truly like lightning. The room was exceedingly light, but not so very bright as immediately around his person. When I first looked upon him, I was afraid, but the fear soon left me. He called me by name and said unto me, that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me, and that his name was Nephi. I interrupt my narrative to mention that Nephi was corrected to Moroni in Book A-1 by church historian Albert Carrington, probably in 1871, to make it consistent with other contemporary sources. Continuing, Smith states, that God had a work for me to do, 
and that my name should be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues, or that it should be both good and evil spoken of among all people. He said there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from whence they sprang. He also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it, as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. Also that there were two stones and silver bows, and these stones fastened to a breastplate constituted what is called the Urim and Thummim, deposited with the plates, and the possession and use of these stones was what constituted seers in ancient or former times, and that God had prepared them for the purpose of translating the book. I pause once again to note that the Urim and Thummim, meaning in Hebrew, light and perfection, is an allusion to divining stones that were part of Aaron's breastplate. While there was no attempt to claim the instrument buried with the plates was the same one used by Jewish high priests before the captivity, as used here, its purpose was to obscure the folk magic connection with seer stones by linking it to the Old Testament. However, the term as applied to Joseph Smith's magic spectacles was not introduced into Mormon thought until about 1832, and so it is an anachronism. In fact, the idea that a translating instrument would be buried with the plates wasn't even Smith's idea, but was suggested by fellow seer Samuel Lawrence in 1825. More on this later. Continuing with Smith's 1838 account. After telling me these things, he commenced quoting the prophecies of the Old Testament. He first quoted part of the third chapter of Malachi, and he quoted also the fourth or last chapter of the same prophecy, though with a little variation from the way it reads in our Bibles. He quoted the fifth verse thus, Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. I pause again to note that the concept that Elijah would reveal the priesthood was absent from Mormon thought until 1836, when Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery claimed Elijah and other heavenly messengers appeared and bestowed various keys upon them in the Kirtland Temple. Oliver Cowdery's 1834-35 history quoted the angel's words and prophecies about the gathering of Israel in the last days at great length, but not one word about priesthood or Elijah. Regardless, this was not part of the earliest recitals of the 1823 vision but is another anachronism. Continuing with Joseph Smith's 1838 account, Again he told me that when I got those plates of which he had spoken, for the time that they should be obtained was not yet fulfilled. I should not show them to any person, neither the breastplate with the Urim and Thummim, only to those to whom I should be commanded to show them. If I did, I should be destroyed. While he was conversing with me about the plates, the vision was opened to my mind that I could see the place where the plates were deposited, and that so clearly and distinctly that I knew the place again when I visited it. Note the similarity to Joseph Smith's 1825 demonstration for Josiah Stoll when he looked into a seer stone and then described Stoll's home and farm 130 miles away in South Bainbridge which Stoll testified to at Smith's 1826 trial. Smith continues his narrative. After this communication, I saw the light in the room begin to gather immediately around the person of him who had been speaking to me, and it continued to do so until the room was again left dark except just around him, when instantly I saw as it were a conduit open right up into heaven, and he ascended up till he entirely disappeared and the room was left as it had been before this heavenly light had made its appearance. According to Smith's account, the same messenger appeared two more times, and repeated the very same things which he had done at his first visit, without the least variation. As we will see, this thrice-repeated message had magical significance. On the last visit, the messenger added a caution to me, telling me that Satan, 
would try to tempt me in consequence of the indigent circumstances of my father's family to get the plates for the purpose of getting rich. This he forbid me, saying that I must have no other object in view in getting the plates but to glorify God, and must not be influenced by any other motive but that of building the kingdom. Otherwise, I could not get them. I shortly after arose from my bed, and as usual went to the necessary labors of the day. But in attempting to labor, as at other times, I found my strength so exhausted as rendered me entirely unable. My father, who was laboring along with me, discovered something to be wrong with me, and told me to go home. I started with the intention of going to the house, but in attempting to cross the fence out of the field where we were, my strength entirely failed me, and I fell helpless on the ground, and for a time was quite unconscious of anything. The first thing that I can recollect was a voice speaking unto me, calling me by name. I looked up and beheld the same messenger standing over my head, surrounded by light as before. He then again related to me all that he had related to me the previous night, and commanded me to go to my father and tell him the vision and commandments which I had received. I obeyed. I returned back to my father in the field, and rehearsed the whole matter to him. He replied to me that it was of God, and to go and do as commanded by the messenger. I left the field and went to the place where the messenger had told me the plates were deposited. And owing to the distinctness of the vision which I had had concerning it, I knew the place the instant that I arrived there. Convenient to the village of Manchester, Ontario County, New York, stands a hill of considerable size and the most elevated of any in the neighborhood. On the west side of this hill, not far from the top, under a stone of considerable size, lay the plates, deposited in a stone box. This stone was thick and rounding in the middle, on the upper side, and thinner towards the edges, so that the middle part of it was visible above the ground, but the edge all around was covered with earth. Having removed the earth and obtained a lever, which I got fixed under the edge of the stone, and with a little exertion raised it up, I looked in, and there, indeed, did I behold the plates, the Urim and Thummim, and the breastplate, as stated by the messenger. The box in which they lay was formed by laying stones together in some kind of cement. In the bottom of the box were laid two stones crossways of the box, and on these stones lay the plates and the other things with them. I made an attempt to take them out but was forbidden by the messenger, and was again informed that the time for bringing them forth had not yet arrived, neither would until four years from that time. But he told me that I should come to that place precisely in one year from that time, and that he would there meet with me, and that I should continue to do so until the time should come for obtaining the plates. Accordingly, as I had been commanded, I went at the end of each year, and at each time I found the same messenger there, and received instruction and intelligence from him at each of our interviews respecting what the Lord was going to do, and how and in what manner his kingdom was to be conducted in the last days. This is where Joseph Smith's narration ends. He next discusses his employment with Josiah Stoll as a money digger, beginning in October 1825 without mentioning his use of a seer stone, or his subsequent trial in South Bainbridge in March 1826, as a disorderly person for pretending to find lost objects through said stone. After mentioning his marriage to Emma Hale in January 1827, he narrates the story of his removal of the plates from the hill in Manchester in September 1827, which will be discussed in another video. Contrary to his promise to put all inquirers after truth into possession of the facts, Smith was less than forthcoming when he misrepresented his involvement in money digging as a one-time event in 1825 as one of Josiah Stoll's hired hands. In fact, however, he was a leader in many such operations over a period of at least three years, locating the places to dig with his seer stone. Non-Mormon historian 
Alan Taylor, who charitably referred to Smith's prevarication as a de-emphasis, suggested that Smith recognized that a reputation for treasure-seeking was a handicap in communicating his message to an audience increasingly committed to rationality and a more abstract understanding of religion. Jan Ships was also charitable when she said, It seems reasonable to conclude that the motive for playing down this part of the prophet's background was the knowledge that it could be used as the basis for charges that might endanger his reputation. Actually, Joseph Smith was doing more than preserving his reputation. He was overhauling his history and reinventing himself to become a more suitable leader for his followers and potential followers. If Smith was to consolidate and expand his authority and influence, his story would have to lose its cultural particularity and become more universal. Thus, it is also quite apparent, as D. Michael Quinn and others have demonstrated, that Joseph Smith de-emphasized the folk magic and treasure-seeking context of his 1823 and 1827 encounters with Moroni, and inserted anachronistic elements such as the terms angel and the Urim and Thummim, and the reference to Elijah returning to reveal the priesthood, all of which gave it a more mainstream Christian flavoring. I shall therefore strip away these anachronisms and search for the earliest version of the story, one that appealed to his treasure-seeking father and friends. In fact, the story Smith told was so believable that his fellow treasure-seeking companions made repeated attempts to find the plates and other treasures in the hill, although later, after Joseph's story became more fully developed, they rejected it as a hoax. First off, the night of the 21st of September, 1823, was significant for treasure seekers, as believing historian D. Michael Quinn has noted. Smith's prayer on 21 September, 1823, occurred once the moon reached its maximum fullness the previous day, and just before the autumnal equinox. The full moon was the preferred time for treasure digging. Quinn also notes, Smith began praying late Sunday night on the 21st of September, 1823, as he claimed, to commune with some kind of messenger. Astrological guides specified that Sunday night was the only night of the week ruled by Jupiter. Jupiter, Smith's ruling planet, was the most prominent astrological symbol on his family's golden layman, or holiness to the Lord, parchment, for summoning a good spirit. Earlier that evening, according to what Martin Harris later told Palmyra minister John A. Clark in the fall of 1827, Joseph had acted as a seer for a local treasure-seeking expedition. Consequently, long before the idea of a golden Bible entered their minds, in their excursions for money digging, which I believe usually occurred in the night, that they might conceal from others the knowledge of the place where they struck upon treasures, Joe used to be usually their guide, putting into a hat a peculiar stone he had, through which he looked to decide where they should begin to dig. According to Martin Harris, it was after one of these night excursions that Joe, while he lay upon his bed, had a remarkable dream. In her history, Lucy Smith did not mention the digging that occurred on the astrologically significant night. Instead, she related that her family stayed up late into the evening, conversing upon the subject of the diversity of churches that had risen up in the world, and the many thousand opinions in existence as to the truths contained in Scripture. Not an unlikely topic for a late Sunday night conversation, but Lucy probably minimizes the intensity of this discussion, since young Joseph's reaction was more extreme than on any previous occasion. Lucy noticed that 17-year-old Joseph seemed withdrawn, as if in deep contemplation. He was quiet, but not unaffected. Whatever he may have felt about his part in the treasure hunt, it was undoubtedly his parents' religious turmoil that most stirred him, in the words of his mother, to reflect more deeply than common persons of his age. 
upon everything of a religious nature. Joseph, more than any of his siblings, well understood the religious quandary in which his parents found themselves. There was much he could say, but in the swirl of emotional debate, who would hear him? Besides, he was just a youth with little standing or authority in such matters. More than anything, Joseph's silence likely resulted from his ambivalent feelings and the high emotional price of choosing sides. Very little was resolved when the Smith family finally retired for the night. It was evidently a sleepless night for young Joseph, and the following day he would tell his family an incredible story. In Joseph's account, the angel simply commands him to tell his father. In Lucy's version, the messenger asked Joseph why he had not told his father about the plates, to which Joseph responded, I was afraid my father would not believe me. But the messenger assured Joseph that his father would believe every word you say to him. Joseph's hesitancy to tell his father was likely due to the reception he received in telling his first vision experience of 1820, which he said in his 1832 history he could find none that would believe the heavenly vision. Nevertheless, I pondered these things in my heart. Joseph's one line of authority with his father was his gift of seeing and his father's belief in treasure lore about guardian spirits. When Joseph returned to his father and brother, he told them an amazing but not entirely unfamiliar story. In relating it, Joseph did not stray far from his father's belief in hidden treasures and guardian spirits. Unlike the vision of a wingless angel with long flowing robe that Smith would later narrate for an audience unreceptive to folk magic, the earliest accounts identify the heavenly messenger as a spirit who visited Joseph three times in a dream. About June 1829, Martin Harris, for instance, told people in Rochester that Joseph had been visited by the Spirit of the Almighty in a dream, and informed that in a certain hill was deposited a golden Bible, and that after a third visit from the same Spirit in a dream, he proceeded to the spot. Pamara newspaper man Abner Cole reported in 1831 that Joseph Sr. described the spirit as a little old man with a long beard. Reporting on the activities of the first Mormon missionaries in Ohio, under the direction of Oliver Cowdery, the Painesville Telegraph for the 30th of November, 1830, said, The new gospel, they say, was found in Ontario County, New York, and was discovered by an angel of light appearing in a dream to a man by the name of Smith. Locating treasures through dreams was not uncommon in Smith's day, and thrice repeated dreams were especially significant. In 1786, Silas Hamilton, a prominent leader of Whittingham, Vermont, recorded 21 instances of people from various locations throughout New England, claiming to have located mines and other valuable deposits through dreams. In one instance, a Mr. Barnes of Guilford, New Hampshire, dreamed three times in one night about said hogshead of money. In her 1835 book, Traits of American Life, Sarah Josepha Hale published a late 18th century legend about a deacon Bascom, one of the founders of Newport, New Hampshire. One night, the deacon was visited three times in a dream by a man clothed in black, who told him where to find a silver mine under a large stone. When he proceeded to the spot and found the stone, he hesitated to uncover the treasure. After much anguish, he concluded that the dream was inspired by the devil and would bring ruin to his children, so he returned home. The legend of Deacon Bascom is typical of the treasure lore embedded in the folk consciousness of Smith's contemporaries. As it turns out, however, the Smith family not only inherited this rich tradition, but contributed to it as well. Former Manchester neighbor, Oren P. Rockwell, who like Smith walked with a limp, 
recalled in 1872 that his mother, Sarah, and Lucy Smith used to spend their Saturday evenings together telling their dreams and comparing notes and telling how such a one's dream and such another's pointed to the same lucky spot, how the spades often struck the iron sides of a treasure chest, and how it was charmed away, now six inches this side, now four feet deeper, and again completely out of reach. Joseph's story mirrored his father's dreams as well, which sometimes included spirit guides who instructed him about the location of a box or a beautiful garden. Following the rehearsal of his incredible story, Joseph Jr. remembered that his father wept and replied that it was of God and to go and do as commanded by the messenger. Lucy gave more detail, stating that his father charged him not to fail in attending strictly to the instruction which he had received from this heavenly messenger. Lucy's version, with its emphasis on following the treasure guardian's instructions precisely, captures more fulsomely the folk magic context of the story. Joseph said that he immediately left the field and went to the hill alone. This glacially formed drumlin had long since caught the attention of all who traveled the Canandaigua Road between the villages of Palmyra and Manchester. At the time of Smith's visit, the hill was forested except for its northern summit, which was covered with grass, rocks, and a few scattered trees. When he returned home later that evening, he related another incredible story, but still one that was familiar to the treasure seekers and his family. As soon as he entered the house, Lucy recalled that Joseph Sr. anxiously pressed his son, wanting to know if he had been successful in obtaining the plates. No, father, I could not get them, Joseph answered. Did you see them? Joseph Sr. asked. Yes, Joseph said. I saw them, but could not take them. I would have taken them if I had been in your place, Joseph Sr. replied. Why, you do not know what you say, Joseph said. I could not get them, for the angel of the Lord would not let me. As his family gathered around him, Joseph began to relate all that he had made known to his father in the field, as well as what had occurred on the hill earlier that day. Regarding Joseph's visit to the hill, Lucy remembered that Joseph told his family he climbed to the hill's summit, pried up a large stone, and discovered the gold plates encased in a stone box, just as the heavenly messenger had described. As he lifted the plates from the box, he wondered if there might be something else in the container that could bring some pecuniary advantage to him and his family, and wishing to protect the treasure, set the plates down behind him and replaced the cover stone. When he turned around to retrieve the plates, they had vanished. Surprised, Joseph asked why the plates had been taken from him. Instantly, the heavenly messenger appeared and explained that he had not been diligent in obeying his instructions. Joseph had faltered on two counts. He had allowed covetous thoughts to enter his mind. The messenger had said that the plates could not be brought forth with an eye to worldly gain and he had received strict commandment not to lay the plates down or put them for a moment out of his hands until he got into the house and deposited them in a chest or trunk, having a good lock and key. Joseph was permitted to raise the large stone again and saw that the plates had miraculously returned to their original location. According to Lucy, he immediately reached forth his hand to take them, but instead of getting them, as he anticipated, he was hurled back upon the ground with great violence. After recovering, he discovered that the messenger had disappeared. Lucy Smith's 1845 account contains elements not mentioned by Joseph in 1838. The themes of following magic formulae precisely, being attacked by the treasure guardian spirit, and the miraculous movement of treasure were familiar to those steeped in treasure lore about cursed and enchanted treasures. As early as 1729, Benjamin Franklin and Joseph Brightnall described the prevalence of money digging, stating, 
They wander through the woods and bushes by day to discover the marks and signs. At midnight, they repair to the hopeful spot with spades and pickaxes. Full of expectation, they labor violently, trembling at the same time in every joint through fear of certain malicious demons who are said to haunt and guard such places. While digging for treasure in Rochester, New York, in 1814, it was claimed by one company that when the rule of silence was violated, the charm was broken, the scream of demons, the chattering of spirits, and hissing of serpents rent the air, and the treasure moved. This 1832 painting by John Quidor, called The Money Diggers, presently in the Brooklyn Museum, captures the moment of the guardian spirit's appearance. Based on Washington Irving's 1824 story, The Adventure of the Black Fisherman, Quidor's painting shows the three main characters, the miserly Dutchman, the sinister German sorcerer, with his divining rod at his feet, and the superstitious black fisherman, digging for treasure in a New York cemetery. The Smith's neighbors in Manchester testify to their use of magic circles and magic formulae in the attempt to dislodge buried treasure from their guardian spirits. One night, William Stafford, who lived about a mile south of the Smith's on Stafford Road, was visited by Joseph Sr., who invited him to participate in a treasure dig. He informed Stafford that Joseph Jr. had seen in his stone two or three kegs of gold and silver, located not many rods from Smith's house, and that he and Stafford were the only two men who could get the treasure. Making their way through the dark, they arrived at the place of deposit. Stafford probably held the lantern as Joseph Sr. drew a circle in the dirt. 12 or 14 feet in diameter, and then explained that the treasure was located in the center. Joseph Sr. took some witch hazel stakes and drove them into the ground at regular intervals around the circle, as he explained, for keeping off the evil spirits. Within this barrier, he drew another inner circle, about 8 or 10 feet in diameter, then walked around three times on the periphery of this last circle muttering to himself something which I could not understand, Stafford recalled. Next he drove a steel rod in the center of the circles in order to prevent the treasure from moving. Smith ordered silence, lest we should arouse the evil spirit who had the charge of these treasures. Then the two men began digging. They continued until they dug a trench about five feet in depth around the rod. Believing they had isolated the treasure in a cone of earth, they tore into the mound, hoping to be faster than the treasure guardian. But the treasure was gone. Puzzled, Smith went to the house to ask young Joseph why they had failed. He soon returned, explaining to Stafford that Joseph had remained all this time in the house, looking in his stone and watching the motions of the evil spirit that he saw the spirit come up to the ring, and as soon as it had beheld the cone which we had formed around the rod, it caused the money to sink. When the two men returned to the house together, Father Joseph observed that we had made a mistake in the commencement of the operation, and if it had not been for that, said he, we should have got the money. At Joseph Smith's 1826 trial, Testimony was given about his locating buried treasure with his seer stone, and the treasure not being obtained due to its enchantment in moving away. Jonathan Thompson, a believer in Smith's gift, testified that after digging several feet, they struck upon something sounding like a board or plank, whereupon he asked Smith to look in his stone, but Smith refused, stating that he was alarmed the last time he looked, on account of the circumstances relating to the trunk being buried, which came all fresh to his mind, that the last time he looked, he discovered distinctly the two Indians who buried the trunk, that a quarrel ensued between them, and that one of said Indians was killed by the other, and thrown into the hole beside the trunk, to guard it 
as he supposed. Thompson went on to say that the board he struck his spade upon was probably the chest, but on account of an enchantment, the trunk kept settling away from under them while digging, that notwithstanding they continued constantly removing the dirt, yet the trunk kept about the same distance from them. Manchester resident Willard Chase and Joseph Knight, a Smith family friend and early Mormon convert from Colesville, New York, corroborate Lucy's story. Chase, who heard the account from Joseph Sr. in 1827, said in 1833 that Joseph removed the plates from the box, but fearing someone might discover where he got it, he laid it down to place the top stone as he found it, and turning around, to his surprise, there was no book in sight. Knight said he was told that Joseph had disobeyed the command to take the book and go right away, but set the plates down, only to discover moments later that they had disappeared. Both Chase and Knight tell about Joseph removing the stone and discovering that the plates had miraculously returned to their place. They also mention Joseph trying to remove them again. However, Knight's account fails to mention that Joseph was struck, but instead states that he could not stir the book any more than he could the mountain. Chase's account is similar to Lucy's, but takes the story a step closer to folk magic tales about gnomes and treasure guardians. He remembered that Joseph Sr. told him that Joseph again opened the box and in it saw the book and attempted to take it out, but was hindered. He saw in the box something like a toad, which soon assumed the appearance of a man and struck him on the side of his head. Not being discouraged at trifles, he again stooped down and strove to take the book, when the spirit struck him again, and knocked him three or four rods, and hurt him prodigiously. Chase's account is supported by Benjamin Saunders, Lorenzo's younger brother, who said he heard Joseph tell his mother and sister in 1827 that when he took the plates, there was something down near the box that looked something like a toad that rose up into a man, which forbid him to take the plates. Despite some variances in the details, the story that Joseph told was clearly one that dramatized the treasure seeker's expectations regarding gnomes and other treasure guardians, who lurked just outside their magic circles. As treasure lore had it, these spirit beings could transform themselves into whatever animal they pleased. In this case, the creature Joseph said resembled a toad was not a real toad, neither was it like any animal he had seen before and could name. Nevertheless, the toad had long been associated with witchcraft, evil spirits, and the casting of magical spells. One of young Joseph's occult mentors, Lumen Walters, reportedly, in addition to reading from a Latin book, drawing circles with a rusty sword, and scrying with a stone, also used a stuffed toad as a prop. The idea that the messenger could assume animal form seems to be reflected in David Whitmer's statement that after transporting Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery from Harmony to Fayette in June 1829, he was impressed that the angel was under his father's shed, which was confirmed by Smith. Knight and Chase mention another detail that is absent from Lucy's account. After recovering from his fright, Chase said, Joseph inquired why he could not obtain the plates, to which the spirit made reply, Because you have not obeyed your orders. He then inquired when he could have them, and was answered thus, Come one year from this day, and bring with you your oldest brother, and you shall have them. Knight gave a similar account, stating that Joseph exclaimed, Why can't I stir this book? And he was answered, you have not done right. You should have took the book and gone right away. You can't have it now. 
Joseph says, When can I have it? The answer was, The 22nd day of September next, if you bring the right person with you. Joseph says, Who is the right person? The answer was, Your oldest brother. The requirement to bring Alvin the following year was also mentioned by others, like Lorenzo Saunders and Fayette Latham, the latter of whom interviewed Joseph Smith Sr. in 1830. However, this element may have been added by Joseph Jr. in 1824 to explain why he had failed a second time to get the plates. The Smith family soon forgot their religious differences as they gathered nightly to hear Joseph Jr.'s stories. Lucy reports that we sat up very late and listened attentively to all that he had to say to us. On the night following Joseph's first trip to the hill, Alvin suggested that the family get up early the next morning in order to finish their labor an hour earlier than usual, thus having more time in the evening to hear more of Joseph's account. The following day, the family pursued their labors with excited anticipation for what they might hear that evening. At last, just before sunset, Lucy recalled that the family was ready to be seated and give our undivided attention to Joseph's recitals. Joseph charged them with secrecy about the gold plates. Brother William remembered that the whole family were melted to tears and believed all he said. Joseph quickly emerged from his former stance of quiet observer to the center of attention at these nightly gatherings. Every evening we gathered our children together, Lucy recalled, all seated in a circle, father, mother, sons, and daughters, listening in breathless anxiety to the religious teachings of a boy, seventeen years of age. This was a creative time for Joseph. In the course of our evening conversations, Lucy said, Joseph would give us some of the most amusing recitals which could be imagined. He would describe the ancient inhabitants of this continent, their dress, their manner of traveling, the animals which they rode, the cities that were built by them, the structures of their buildings, with every particular of their mode of warfare, their religious worship, as particularly as though he had spent his life with them. Clearly, Joseph was honing his talent as a storyteller. Even without the gold plates, Joseph's recitals produced the desired effect. We were convinced that God was about to bring to light something that we might stay our minds upon, something that we could get a more definite idea of than anything which had been taught us hitherto and we rejoiced in it with exceeding great joy. The sweetest union and happiness pervaded our house, and no jar nor discord disturbed our peace, and tranquility reigned in our midst. Indeed, in light of Joseph's important errand, their former problems seemed trivial. On the 19th of November, 1823, less than two months following Joseph Jr.'s necromantic encounter on the hill. Alvin died of an apparent intestinal blockage. Lucy said that Alvin manifested a greater zeal and anxiety than any of the rest of the family with regard to the record. He always showed the most intense interest concerning the matter. But mention of the gold plates was painful in the wake of his death. Lucy recalled that, Whenever Joseph spoke of the plates, it would immediately bring Alvin to our minds with all his kindness, his affection, his zeal and piety. And when we looked to his place and realized that he was gone from it, to return no more in this life, we all wept with one accord for our irretrievable loss, and we could not be comforted because he was not. Consequently, Lucy said, we could not bear to hear anything said upon the subject. Thus, Joseph had lost his central place in the family's evening conversations. As stated, it is unclear at what point Joseph told his family 
that Alvin's presence was required to obtain the plates. Was Alvin, on his deathbed, aware that the angel had required his presence on the hill the following year? Did he know the possible implications of his instruction to Joseph to do everything that lays in your power to obtain the records? Or had Joseph held back the requirement for Alvin's presence until 1824, when he explained to his family the reason for his second failure? Regardless, it may not have been intended that Joseph would ever actually get the plates. He may have been satisfied, for the time being, with simply narrating his conversations with the messenger, which, according to Lucy, he continued to receive from time to time. As he would later demonstrate, he could see the plates and the translation in his stone without the plates being present. In any event, following his visit to the hill in September 1824, he once again returned to his family with disappointing news. Within days of Joseph's unsuccessful visit to the hill, Joseph Sr. exhumed Alvin's body under the pretext of settling for himself a vicious rumor that Alvin had been removed from the place of his interment and dissected. In a notice to the public that was printed in the Wayne Sentinel and dated 25th of September, 1824, Joseph Smith Sr. announced that for the purpose of ascertaining the truth of such reports, I, with some of my neighbors, this morning, repaired to the grave, and removing the earth, found the body which had not been disturbed. The timing of this event suggests that the controversy over Alvin's body was in some way connected with the messenger's requirement. Were the rumors the result of neighborhood speculation about the extent to which the Smiths would go to get the gold plates, forcing Joseph Sr. to prove such was not the case? According to Lucy, Joseph Jr. had told the family to keep the circumstances of his discovery of the plates to themselves. However, Joseph Sr.'s explanation for disinterring Alvin's body is questionable because one should have been able to determine if the grave had been recently disturbed without exhuming the body. It seems probable, therefore, that Joseph Sr. himself may have been the source of the rumor that the story was a ruse to exhume Alvin's body for its use in attempting to get the gold plates. Perhaps Joseph Sr.'s exuberance resurfaced as it had the previous year when he told his son, I would have taken them if I had been in your place. Was he refusing to give up? If so, the incident would demonstrate how thoroughly the father believed his son's claims. Both Lucy and Joseph Jr., in their narratives, skipped over the latter's 1824 visit to the hill. But Willard Chase said that when Joseph appeared without Alvin, the messenger told him he could not have the plates until he should come again in just one year and bring a man with him. On asking who might be the man, he was answered that he would know him when he saw him. This vague instruction afforded Joseph some flexibility in searching for Alvin's substitute, and three years passed before he finally named his wife, Emma, as the person who would accompany him to the hill. Nothing is known of his 1825 and 1826 visits to the hill outside of Smith's later claim to have made them. This brings into question whether he actually made annual visits despite his inability to fulfill the messenger's requirement. During the revival of 1824-25, Lucy and her three oldest children joined the Presbyterian Church. Young Joseph also participated and was by his own admission partial to the Methodists. But when he discovered that his stories of communion with the dead were not well received, he withdrew and returned to his money digging. In the fall of 1825, according to Chase, he sent Hiram to borrow the stone again, claiming that Joseph needed it 
to accomplish some business of importance, which could not very well be done without the aid of the stone. As September 1825 neared, Joseph seemed to entertain the idea that fellow treasure seer Samuel T. Lawrence might be a good candidate for Alvin's substitute. At least his close friendship with Lawrence led Willard Chase to arrive at such a conclusion. Joseph seemed to trust Lawrence with information he otherwise withheld from other treasure seekers, even showing him the location of the gold plates. However, Joseph quickly learned that Lawrence was a shrewd competitor. When he showed Lawrence the location of the plates, the latter apparently had brought his own seer stone. For Chase said that Lawrence asked Joseph if he had ever discovered anything with the plates of gold. Joseph said, No. Lawrence then asked him to look in his stone to see if there was anything with them. Joseph looked, but said he could see nothing. Lawrence told him to look again and see if there was not a large pair of specks with the plates. Joseph looked and soon saw a pair of spectacles, the same with which Joseph says he translated the Book of Mormon. This became an added element to the original story. Indeed, the spectacles would subsequently play a brief role in Smith's translation of the gold plates. Not long after this, according to Chase, Joseph altered his mind and said, Lawrence was not the right man, nor had he, Joseph, told him the right place. Of course, Joseph had no intention of making Lawrence, his rival, a substitute for Alvin. More likely, Joseph was merely hoping to get additional testimony to support the existence of the plates. If he could not get the plates, he would at least get testimony of their existence. However, he did not anticipate Lawrence's response. His friend not only confirmed the existence of the plates, but then sought to establish his own seeric abilities above and beyond Smith's. Joseph would not get what he wanted from Lawrence without a price. He had no choice but to confirm, albeit reluctantly, the existence of the spectacles Lawrence said he saw. Thus, Joseph received his first witness to the existence of the plates, and Lawrence secured from Joseph a testimony of his own exceptional gift. Joseph had much to learn from the older, more experienced seers. Although Lawrence is listed as being in his forties in the 1830 Palmyra census, his whereabouts after 1833 are unknown. When Philastus Herobut visited the Palmyra area in late 1833 to interview the Smith's former neighbors, Lawrence was evidently unavailable. On the 17th of April, 1833, a Samuel T. Lawrence was indicted for fraudulently secreting property and ordered to appear at court. It may be that in an effort to bolster his Syriac claims, Lawrence resorted to hiding a neighbor's property and then pretending to find it. That no subsequent record of the trial appears in the docket indicates that Lawrence perhaps chose to leave the area rather than to face the charges. In the accounts that emanated from Joseph Smith in 1832, 1834-35, and 1838, there seems to be a conscious effort to downplay the folk magic context of the original story. In 1838, for instance, he said he found the plates because of the distinctness of the vision which I had had concerning it. Other accounts, including those of Willard Chase and Martin Harris, report that Smith found them by using his seer stone. Chase said that during the fall of 1827, Smith confessed to him that if it had not been for that stone, which he acknowledged belonged to me, he would not have obtained the book. In none of Smith's accounts, were the plates removed from the box. Consequently, in these versions, he does not disobey the orders by setting the plates on the ground, nor do the plates seem enchanted when they disappear and magically reappear inside the box. In 1832, 
Smith said he went to the hill and straightway made three attempts to take the plates, but failing, he became exceedingly frightened. In Oliver Cowdery's account, written under Smith's guidance in 1835, Joseph experienced three successive shocks, each more powerful than the previous. Aware of Eber D. Howe's publication of affidavits from Smith's former New York neighbors, including Willard Chase, Cowdery admits that Smith initially interpreted these shocks within a treasure-seeking context, stating that Smith had heard of the power of enchantment and a thousand like stories, which held the hidden treasures of the earth, and supposed that physical exertion and personal strength was only necessary to enable him to yet obtain the object of his wish, and therefore persisted in his attempt to get the plates. In his 1838 history, Smith reduced the event to, I made an attempt to take them out, but was forbidden by the messenger. An important element in the story that more than anything pointed 19th century minds towards treasure lore was the claim that the plates were protected by the spirit of a dead mortal. As D. Michael Quinn has noted, it was not customary in Joseph Smith's day to use angel to describe a personage who had been mortal, had died, and was returning to earth to give a message to someone, while at the same time the visit of a spirit messenger to a human was common in magic and familiar to folk perceptions. When Abner Cole said in 1831 that Joe Smith never pretended to have any communion with angels until a long period after the pretended finding of his book, he was claiming that there was a shift in meaning between 1823 and 1827, which very well may be true. Cole had earlier said, Joe made league with the spirit who afterwards turned out to be an angel. Obviously, for Cole, angels were distinct beings from ghosts or the spirits of dead mortals. Evidently, Joseph Smith expanded his definition of angel to include a particular treasure guardian. While Lucy and other family members make it clear that God was involved from the start, the word angel is anachronistic to the 1823 setting. Like his mother, Joseph also failed to mention the requirement to bring Alvin. Making impossible demands is what one would expect from a treasure guardian, and it provided a plausible reason for not obtaining the plates. In retrospect, as the story departed further from its folk magical origins, it became increasingly difficult to explain why God's messenger would not have foreseen Alvin's death. If Joseph's first vision failed to secure his father's full attention, this recital did. Joseph had learned to speak his father's language. Joseph's 1823 recital drew from symbols available in Joseph Sr.'s world, seer stones, dreams, guardian spirits, and enchanted treasures. Like Joseph Sr.'s early dreams recounted by Lucy, young Joseph said he had a remarkable dream in which an attendant spirit told him about a box that contained wisdom and understanding. Upon finding the container, Joseph was confronted by something that frightened him, not the host of threatening beasts that caused his father to flee for his life, but a toad-like creature that transformed itself into the spirit of a little old man who struck him. That Joseph's 1823 encounters with the spirit over the gold book essentially supported Joseph Sr.'s dreams was recognized by Abner Cole, editor of the Palmyra Reflector, who understood in 1831 that the spirit's tidings corresponded precisely with the revelations made to and predictions made by the Elder Smith a number of years before. How could Joseph Sr. not believe this account? 